Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. I'm Lisa Clark, your host from NOAA Central Library. Today's presentation about coastal blue carbon, what it is and how NOAA is engaged, is brought to you by the NOAA Coastal Blue Carbon Team. Before I hand the mic over to the group, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. We encourage questions and we want to hear from you, so please type them in the questions chat box found in the control panel at any time. We will address them at the end of the presentation. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic's all yours, guys. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Curran with uh, NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. I'm located in Beaufort, North Carolina, and I'm going to kick off this presentation today on coastal blue carbon by our NOAA team. Uh, next slide, Janine. Salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds are very efficient at capturing and storing large quantities of carbon, which we refer to as coastal blue carbon. National Ocean Service, National Fishery Service, and the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research have been working together to identify synergies and collaborations uh, across our agencies and to lever leverage our knowledge and resources on coastal blue carbon. In today's presentation, we're going to define coastal blue carbon and its role in greenhouse gas inventories. We're going to describe our current work in NOAA on coastal blue carbon and provide you with some resources uh, you can go to to learn more about uh, coastal blue carbon. And at the end of today's presentation, there'll be an opportunity to, uh, to uh, ask any questions and have a discussion. This photograph on the right is a beautiful salt marsh habitat from North Carolina, illustrating that carbon-rich sediment that underlies these coastal habitats. Next slide. Coastal blue carbon habitats include, as I mentioned, salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with these habitats and the very important ecosystem services that they provide, including fish habitat, uh, removing nutrients, trapping sediments to improve water quality. Uh, and so we're familiar with these habitats, and more recently, we're learning of this very important role in terms of um, carbon storage and, and, uh, and carbon sequestration. These habitats include salt marshes on the far left, which are intertidal, and mangroves, which are intertidal, and of course, seagrasses there on the right are subtidal uh, habitats. And they all store uh, significant amounts of carbon in their soils underlying them. And mangroves in particular also store carbon in the woody biomass. Next slide. I just want to define a couple of terms uh, in, our, in our conversation. We use the term sequestration to indicate the conversion of carbon dioxide that's fixed via photosynthesis into plant biomass. And so that process removes CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, in the case of mangroves and salt marshes, or from dissolved CO2 in the ocean for, this, uh, in, in, for seagrasses. So it's this removal of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, um, into plant biomass where it's sequestered in that plant biomass. The next step is storage, where we're talking about long-term retention, um, decades, century, or even millennia, of that fixed plant carbon into either woody biomass, in the case of mangroves, and in all cases in that rich, carbon-rich soil that underlies these habitats. Also want to just talk a little bit about carbon flux, which we, which we mean that exchange of carbon between the atmosphere, land, the oceans, and these coastal wetland systems. And this carbon exchange occurs in a variety of forms. It can be gaseous, carbon dioxide, or methane. Methane, it includes both dissolved and particulate forms of carbon, and both organic and inorganic forms. And it can be a real challenge to track all this. 
Um, you have to track exchanges with the atmosphere. You have to exchange, track changes that occur in tidal waters that are flooding these habitats, as well as um, distinguish between inorganic and inorganic forms in the sediments. So uh, there's a lot of research around this, and we continue to improve our understanding to make sure that we're really properly accounting for a net removal of carbon uh, of CO2 from the atmosphere in these systems. Next slide. So here you see uh, on the left a, a schematic of um, these processes in these in the three habitats that we're, we're talking about. So you can see at the top here we've got CO2 in the atmosphere, and that that first initial step of photosynthesis is represented by the green arrow, uh, which in mangroves goes to form above ground leaves and woody biomass, as I mentioned, and in the grasses that's forming um, both uh, live biomass. Uh, above ground, as well as a significant amount of below ground root biomass, which can equal or even exceed the above, above ground bi biomass uh, in marshes in particular. The next step then is uh, that below ground biomass and detritus gets stored in the sediments below these systems. And because these sediments are anoxic, um, there's very little microbial decomposition. And so that some of that carbon gets stored for a very, very long time. Another thing um, to mention is that, uh, particularly for mangroves and salt marshes, they're intertidal systems. And so over the course of the last several thousand years, as we've been experiencing um, increasing rates of sea level rise, these habitats um, trap sediments and build their elevation over time to keep up the sea level rise and maintain that position in the intertidal. So they're not only increasing that concentration of carbon in the blue ground sediments, they're also increasing the volume of that sediment. And so it can be really effective um, at long-term storage of, um, of carbon in their systems. Uh, we also see uh, kelp over there. I uh, just want to mention that it's not in this, in this figure, uh, although it has recently been considered um, as a coastal blue carbon habitat. Uh, kelp are macroalgae uh, that grow offshore. Um, they don't have any carbon storage in the soil underneath them or sediment underneath them, um, but they are large macroalgae and they do have very high rates of primary production. And some of that live biomass can be transported offshore into the deep ocean and therefore removed um, from the atmosphere. Uh, however, because of these features of transport into the deep ocean and um, you know, location offshore, they present some difficulties in terms of accounting and management. Uh, so right now we're not we're not really considering them in this presentation today, um, but we do want to mention that. And also want to mention that um, kelp farming, which has um, gotten more interest lately, because the products of the kelp farming end up as food, feed, or fuel, they are not stored. And so that would not be a uh, coastal blue carbon uh, effort. Okay, next slide. And it's important, we think, to mention a couple of really uh, valuable coastal blue habitats in terms of the ecosystem services they provide. Um, and just want to make clear um, their role or, or what they can and can't do in terms of, of carbon storage. And so I want to start off talking about corals and oysters, which produce carbonate skeletons. Um, however, that process of calcification in which those carbonate skeletons are formed, as you can see in the equation there, um, actually releases CO2, so that, that, uh, that binding of carbonate releases CO2 into the ocean, and so there is not a net um, carbon sequestration. And of course, oysters and corals are animals, so they're not photosynthesizing any carbon as well. So there is not a net carbon removal associated with the formation of oysters and corals. Of course, the algae and corals are also turning over very rapidly. So although they play a very important role in terms of um, ecosystem service, they are not blue carbon habitats. Uh, another uh, process or organism that's been mentioned in terms of uh, blue carbon uh, lately is, is whales. And it's really interesting. They are large organisms. Um, obviously, they're not photosynthesizing, but they have a lot of carbon in them. And when they fall to the bottom of the sea, they can be a very important part of the marine carbon cycle. But they, again, are not what we typically consider of um, coastal blue carbon uh, organisms. And as I've 
hope I probably conveyed to you, hope I hasn't been totally confusing, I've been clear, but I think uh, you can see some of the complexity in terms of really understanding the exchanges of carbon between these different ecosystems and, and habitats and, and uh, forms of carbon. And so we continue to perform research to improve our understanding um, of coastal blue carbon habitats. And one more slide, Janine. Uh, along those same lines, uh, another uh, type of habitat that does occur in coastal um, ecosystems but are not considered coastal blue carbon habitats are freshwater and brackish wetlands. Again, um, habitat for lots of organisms, um, lots of ecosystem services there. But I mentioned earlier the, the key of that long-term um, preservation of carbon in the sediments of the of, uh, salt marshes and, and uh, mangroves and seagrasses that occurs as well in freshwater wetlands. But uh, the big difference is the end products of the microbial decomposition in these freshwater systems. So these are anoxic soils um, and, as, and in, in seawater systems, sulfate bacteria um, are responsible for the bulk of decomposition. And sulfate reduction releases CO2 in, in that decomposition. And so, you know, the net balance between primary production by the plants and then decomposition within a year or two, it's only a few percentage of an annual primary production that's preserved for that centuries to millennia. Um, most of it is just turned around and releases in CO2. So there's somewhat of a steady state there. The problem with freshwater wetlands is there's no sulfate. If they're not salty, there's no sulfate in the system. And so methanogens um, dominate that final decomposition phase and they release methane. And methane is a much more uh, powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. Over the course of 100 years, it's about 25 times greater in terms of its greenhouse gas impact. So although freshwater and brackish wetlands um, do have a lot of carbon in their soil, that decomposition uh, is offset not one-to-one -one as it is with CO2, but like 25 to one. So there's not a net removal of uh, carbon in these habitats. So mangroves, seagrass, and salt marsh are really special. They have a variety of conditions um, in terms of having uh, salt water, in terms of having these uh, buildup of sediment systems, which make them really effective and really special in terms of uh, carbon sequestration. So that's it for me, and I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joanna Peth. I am a policy analyst within NOAA's National Ocean Service. Um, so as Carolyn just went over, we've learned about what coastal blue carbon is, and now it's time to pivot towards how and why NOAA is engaged on a higher level. So um, NOAA's mission is science, service, and stewardship. And within that, our mission is also to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. And so this puts NOAA in a very critical place to engage in a variety of different coastal blue carbon activities. And so on the slide here, you'll see a diagram that shows the different uh, programs and offices that are involved in our cross-agency coastal blue carbon team. This team has been convening since 2009, back when there was um, a big surge in understanding coastal blue carbon within a previous, the uh, Biden administration, or the Obama administration. And so the reason why there are many programs involved is because it was uh, early on very well understood that there was a lot of cross-discipline and research areas that are needed to understand coastal blue carbon. And so uh, within NOAA, we have three different line offices. And so that's NOAA Fisheries, the National Ocean Service, and NOAA's uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. So within these programs, there is a vast array of different kind of research priorities that we focus on. There's uh, blue carbon coordination, habitat restoration. There's uh, research and mapping when it comes to blue carbon areas. There's also 
an understanding of management of blue carbon uh, that we focus on in our NIRS or National Estuarine Research Reserves, as well as in our sanctuaries and coastal zones. And also there is um, increased understanding of how blue carbon is incorporated into the greenhouse gas inventory and uh, components involving extension and research. So previously, as I mentioned, under the Obama administration, there was a lot of interest around blue carbon, especially in starting to understand the national uh, significance of how blue car coastal blue carbon plays a role in climate mitigation. So during this time, which is about a decade ago at this point, uh, NOAA was able to play a very fundamental role uh, both domestically and internationally, and we were able to successfully get a wetland supplement in the UN's IPCC greenhouse gas inventory guidelines. Prior to that, it was all very much focused on sequestration in more land-based uh, resources such as forests. And so now, uh, after a few years of a bit of political dormancy in the, in, in the interest of coastal blue carbon, we're seeing that interest is renewed again now under the current administration and it's at an even more broader and holistic level. Next slide. So in this current Biden administration, uh, Biden outlined very early on a lot of his top line priorities and that includes climate change as well as the importance of scientific integrity, environmental justice, conservation and sustainability. And within these priorities, there's been a very strong surge in recognition of the use of oceans and coastal ecosystems as a player in tackling what is now being called this climate crisis. Specifically within uh, our leaders of this administration, there's John Kerry, who has always been very vocal in his advocacy for the importance and protection of our oceans. And he is now the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate as well as Jane Lubchenco, who was a former NOAA administrator during the Obama administration, has been appointed a leader in the, in, within the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And so having these leaders on the top is indicative of more things to come with respect to ocean and coastal-based solutions. And so on this slide, I pulled out an excerpt from an executive order that Biden um, gave at the early on in his administration. And this is part of his um, order for tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And so specifically, there was acknowledgement of the importance of uh, coastal ecosystems and how they play in mitigating climate change. And as Carolyn noted, the areas such as wetlands, seagrasses, mangroves, and kelp forests are not only important for protecting our vulnerable coastlines, but they're also important for car uh, sequestration of carbon, as Carolyn had outlined. And so with these directions, it's um, becoming very exciting for our group that has been convening over the last 10 years. And not only is there been increased administration interest in coastal blue carbon, but Congress has also piqued their interest over the last few years as well. Next slide. So on this slide, I've listed a few of the bills that have been introduced that directly acknowledge coastal blue carbon. And so the 16th Congress, the 116th Congress, which started back at the beginning of 2019, there was a lot of interest over the last couple of years. The first one listed here is the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act, which was a very exciting bill that was introduced uh, this time last or about the fall of last year and it was um, you know a little long it was over 300 pages and included 15 different titles on different aspects of our ocean ecosystems that can address climate solutions the first title of which was all about marine and coastal blue carbon included in this was focused on developing a program of coastal blue carbon at NOAA uh, establishing interagency working groups, increasing blue carbon research, understanding and mapping different areas of blue carbon significance, as well as just understanding how blue carbon is a greenhouse gas um, sequester and mitigator as well. 
And so a lot of exciting things are happening. Um, you'll see that Bonamici's name is listed here many times, and she has become a bit of a champion when it comes to coastal blue carbon. In fact, recently uh, she was a, or put together a letter to Biden in response to his infrastructure proposals saying that there needs to be a lot of money that goes towards coastal restoration and resilience projects, advocating for up to $10 billion, citing that coastal blue carbon sequestration is important for the adaptation of our ecosystems for climate change. And so with all of this exciting increased attention, there's also been um, an increased connection between these staff offices as well uh, to the NOAA programs. We've been asked for a lot of um, drafting assistance when it comes to these. And so it is very much understood that NOAA is at the forefront of this work. And so next slide. That brings us to the importance of what NOAA has been doing. And so now that we've learned a little bit about the high level uh, organization of NOAA's engagement, I'll pass it off to Janine, who will get a little bit more into the specifics of our role in coastal blue carbon. Thank you, Joanna. Hi, um, I'm Janine Harris, and I work in NOAA Fisheries in the Office of Habitat Conservation, specifically in the Restoration Center. Um, and thank you, Carolyn and Joanna, for giving us a um, foundation of what coastal blue carbon is and some of the importance that we're seeing on this topic. Um, I'm going to start uh, going into the presentation of where we talk about um, NOAA's role and specific actions that we've been taking and are taking on this topic. And as Joanna said, because NOAA has such a broad mission and we have such a broad breadth of work that we do, um, we have a range of activities that we do in this space, from conserving and protecting these coastal blue carbon habitats to doing fundamental research to understand better the um, carbon storage and sequestration and how that interacts with our coastal systems. Also, we've been supporting those greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas inventories to actually tally the amount of carbon that we um, can say is in these habitats and stored in these habitats. And also we work with um, partners across a range of partnerships to build capacity on this topic um, across the breadth of work that we do. So I'll start going um, into some of these uh, specific activities. To start off, um, our Office of Habitat Conservation um, in NOAA Fisheries, you know, we work on ways to protect and restore these habitats, so keeping them um, as they are, bringing them back to the quality um, for many different reasons, for multiple benefits. Um, specifically, the Restoration Center uses a one technique that we apply is a hydrologic restoration. That's how we categorize some of our restoration work. And hydrologic restoration brings tidal flows back into a system where maybe um, they've been cut off. Maybe a levee um, isn't functioning to bring tidal flows in, um, or there's a culvert or some sort of restriction. And we, um, we work with partners on projects to bring that tidal flow back. And there's multiple benefits uh, to doing a project like that. There's, uh, it restores fish habitat function, um, restores that saltwater and salinity back into a system, um, often can reduce flood risks as well, uh, but it also can have these coastal blue carbon benefits by um, now creating that more saline environment like um, Carolyn described a little in the beginning. One specific example that is an image of here is a project in Tillamook, Oregon, the Southern Flow Corridor Project. It's just an example of these multiple benefits. By restoring um, 500 acres of floodplain, by moving a levee back, um, that habitat was improved for coho salmon. There was that salinity input and also relief from flooding for the community. Uh, partners on that project, the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership and Oregon State University, were able to um, measure carbon storage and sequestration and carbon fluxes at the site, and were able to see that monitoring showed um, strong evidence of high carbon sequestration function at the restoration after restoration, as well as at the reference sites. So this is just an example of all those benefits um, of this kind of work, including the carbon benefits, that can be applied at this location, but also broadly in the Pacific Northwest, where there is still a little bit less data than in other parts of the country. So other offices in NOAA also 
uh, participate in conservation of these habitats. The um, National Marine Sanctuaries and National Estuarine Research Reserves protect and study coastal blue carbon habitats in their locations, in the geographies that they're, um, they're located. Also, sea ground programs have engaged in restoration projects that have restored or protected coastal blue carbon. Um, specifically, the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium has a living shorelines program, and that assists landowners in enhancing marsh habitat for shoreline protection. So a living shoreline might have um, just a small component of marsh there, but there's still those blue carbon benefits in that um, infrastructure. Also, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, their sea grant programs are active in eelgrass restoration in New England. And a variety of sea grant programs have naturalist or similar citizen science programs that actually get volunteers on the ground experiencing uh, community restoration projects in coastal blue carbon habitats. This is just a variety of the NOAA programs that touch on that conservation of the habitats uh, that we're describing. So we're also involved in some of the um, fundamental research on carbon storage and sequestration in these habitats. And some of that applies directly to the conservation or restoration of the habitats. Um, some examples here about how we are increasing our understanding of the value in these habitats, um, they're, they're listed here on this slide. And one thing is being able to talk about that value when thinking about natural infrastructure or nature, natural and nature-based infrastructure, which is um, something that is uh, being talked about a lot more. So we've helped to develop a framework that incorporates uh, coastal blue carbon as an ecosystem service provided by these natural and nature-based infrastructure. So if it's a choice what, what to use um, to mimic nature, this could be one component um, that is considered as one of the services that that kind of habitat can provide. So for example, um, NCOS has done research specifically on coastal blue carbon benefits in those living shorelines where there's a fringe marsh component and has found that there is coastal blue carbon storage existing even in that narrow fringe. So that helps add you know, more services to that type of infrastructure. Also, um, NCOS is currently working on a partnership through their effects of sea level rise program for a project called keep it in the system for a different kind of natural infrastructure of sediment placement on marshes. So working in partnership with University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, US Army Corps of Engineers, and EA Engineering Science Technology, they're trying to better understand not only that sediment placement process and what that means for sea level rise, but also carbon accumulation and storage that's associated with that process as another benefit. So other research that, sorry, I also have the clicker, but make sure it goes at the right time. Um, but other research that NOAA is working on at a more holistic level are, um, we have some internal investments directly with our science staff and partners. And then we also um, have external investments that have been supporting uh, coastal blue carbon um, research. So for example, just in the recent, uh, recently since 2018, we had six peer reviewed papers, including one in the press um, that have focused on a variety of parts of this topic, like carbon balance and sequestration rates in North Carolina salt marshes, where a lot of our research is done. And even specifically the fate of that marsh carbon that's buried in the marsh, you know, what happens to that carbon when there's erosion in the system, which is very important to know because our coasts are dynamic. What, how does that change? How does the carbon change in the coast? Also, our uh, NEARS collaborative research, um, multiple NEARS have different projects focusing on marsh carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas fluxes. Specifically, the Wakoit Bay, Massachusetts NEARS has been studying this for quite a while through their Bringing Wetlands to Market project, um, which has been influential for New England marshes, that understanding of storage, sequestration, and fluxes. And it's important to note that a lot of this work has been possible because of um, collaboration with Holling Scholars. So at least seven Holling Scholars have participated in these research efforts from the NCAS and NEARS. Holling Scholars are undergraduate students that um, are working or are studying in a field that is um, aligns with NOAA's mission. And they 
receive funded um, internships and many of the, those internships have been applied to these coastal blue carbon topics. And besides this internal work, we also have external investments um, such as that Tillamook Bay project I mentioned where there's additional research on carbon um, at that site. And also NOAA Sea Grant program has um, funded in part 30 peer reviewed publications. So it's quite a breadth on our research. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lisa to talk a little bit about um, our partnerships and some of our international work. Great. Thanks, Janine. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Lisa Vaughn, and I'm with NOAA's Climate Program Office, which is part of OAR. And I'm going to talk a little bit about greenhouse gas inventories and the various levels at which we cooperate um, in this particular area of blue carbon. So while coastal wetlands make up less than 1% of the total carbon stock associated with land use and forestry in the contiguous US, and that figure excludes total seagrasses, the carbon storage they do provide can be thought of as an additional ecosystem service that is in increasingly valued and measured. One way to track and communicate the value of this service is through the inclusion of wetlands in greenhouse gas inventories. So NOAA works with our partners at the national, state, and increasingly the international level to foster the integration of blue carbon in greenhouse gas inventories. Through a partnership between NOAA and the Environmental Protection Agency, the US first included wetlands in our national inventory in 2017. And we've been one of the first countries to release detailed data on carbon stocks, stock change, nitrous oxide emissions, and methane emissions. Reporting comprehensive inventories of greenhouse gas sources and sinks are an important step for tracking progress toward meeting the Paris Climate Agreement, which has reemerged uh, as an important priority uh, in the current administration. Next slide. So in addition to working to develop the US national inventory, NOAA builds on its conservation, restoration, and research efforts to help states move toward their coastal management and resilience goals. For example, NOAA has provided technical and scientific support for US Client Alliance, Climate Alliance um, funded projects. The Climate Alliance is a bipartisan coalition of 25 governors committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to levels consistent with the Paris Agreement. Uh, NOAA's National Centers for Ocean Coastal Science supported North Carolina's greenhouse gas inventory for the state's natural and working lands. NOAA provided data on carbon stocks in North Carolina coastal wetlands for use in models and story maps to document current conditions in coastal wetlands, opportunities for restoration and conservation, and potential impacts of accelerated sea level rise on marsh distribution and carbon burial. Hold on just a minute. My webcam is telling me it doesn't like my bandwidth amount here. So I'm gonna keep talking. Let me know if it doesn't come through. Um, through the NOS Coastal Change Analysis Program or CCAP, NOAA produces nationally standardized land cover and land change data for the coastal regions of the US. This data and information about the extent of coastal intertidal areas, wetlands and adjacent uplands is a critical contribution to tracking blue carbon. Next slide. Recently, uh, NOAA, in partnership with the State Department, uh, launched a new um, coastal blue carbon effort focused on integrating coastal wetlands in greenhouse gas inventories in other countries. Um, this is a new effort underway to build on our current capabilities and provide technical assistance and capacity building to a handful of countries. These activities will leverage NOS's International Marine Protected Area Partnerships and OAR work to support blue carbon estimates. All of the line offices that we've discussed already today are engaged in NOAA's blue carbon group and they will probably be part of this project as we move forward. In addition, we'll be working closely with the EPA and other partners such as USAID, um, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Centers, the USDA Forest Service, and other international organizations and national governments to implement this project. We're in the very early stages. Uh, currently, we're conducting a uh, kind of informal assessment to identify partner uh, countries with which we'll work. 
um, based on their scientific and institutional readiness and needs and interest. So uh, we hope to have more information about this project in the next month or so. And then another example of uh, our work on the international scale involves the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. This is a trilateral, or oh, sorry, thanks, Janine. This is a trilateral organization, um, and we've been working with them uh, on several grants that have been funded through the CEC that support blue carbon projects. Uh, the first grant was a two-year mapping project, which compiled the North American data on the distributions and extent of blue carbon habitats on the continent. Um, and the current grant is multifaceted and includes enhanced seagrass mapping and blue carbon policy analysis in Canada and Mexico, in addition to non-blue carbon related MPA management work. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Janine. Thanks, Lisa. One partnership um, that we also wanted to acknowledge is a longstanding uh, partnership effort with Restore America's estuaries. Um, as Lisa mentioned, you know, there's a variety of federal agencies um, and nonprofits that we cross over with. Um, but we've been working with Restore America's estuaries from the beginning of this coastal blue carbon topic. And Restore America's estuaries, or RAE, is an alliance of 10 coastal conservation groups uh, that's a voice for coastal habitat restoration nationally. Um, and they've been influential in creating a community of practice around this topic broadly. So we work together and we support their Coastal Blue Carbon Buzz, which is, which is a monthly um, uh, newsletter that goes out with a lot of resources, research papers, and other presentations and information on this topic. Um, we've also partnered on a recent publication on legal issues that are affecting blue carbon projects on public lands. And this publication with the Roger Williams um, University Law, School of Law and Rhode Island Sea Grant um, is helpful to, for, for managers to think through the process of a coastal blue carbon habitat project and what that means if, you're, um, if the land is in public ownership, not private ownership. So it's, it's helpful for thinking about projects. Um, we also coordinate with Ray, who convenes the Blue Carbon National Working Group. That's a group of professionals working in coastal blue carbon that occasionally meet to talk about research priorities and priorities for the topic. And currently we're applying the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center that CERC has a soil carbon database. So Ray and partners are um, applying that data to analyze at an estuary scale, um, what are the benefits of coastal blue carbon habitats? So actually trying to take one of these tools that have come out um, and put it into practice. And we thought it might be helpful to note just a few resources, and this is not at all uh, comprehensive of everything that's out there, but just some of the partnerships um, or resources that are out there if you're looking for more information on this topic, whether you're a practitioner um, or interested for policy reasons, but a little more practitioner-based, that Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, um, the Research Coordination Network has a soil carbon database with close to 2,000 data points around the country of the soil carbon um, some storage information. So if you um, are looking for that information or if you are collecting similar data, CERC is a place to inquire about um, providing that data for this national look at um, what, what we know about coastal blue carbon um, storage and sequestration. Also, Natural Resources Conservation Service, their Coastal Zone Soil Survey is actively looking to expand and um, learn more about subaqueous soils. So this would relate to the seagrass habitats and better mapping those soils and where the, and and better understanding the sediment profiles of those subaqueous habitats, which includes carbon storage as well. Um, there's and then that information can be combined with the web soil survey for this comprehensive look at these sediments across the country. So again, just two um, two other partners that have. Um, more information that you might want to look into or other that are looking at other aspects of coastal blue carbon and have some data that you might be interested in. And here at NOAA, this community of practice that's presenting today, um, we started calling ourselves a community of practice more formally um, a few years ago, but we've been working together for over a decade. Um, we have some resources out there as well. 
we have a web page which we maintain that covers all like broadly NOAA's coastal blue carbon work and on that page you can find yearly accomplishment reports that we started in 2015. Uh, the 2020 accomplishment report is in draft so that'll be coming out soon. Our group we also oversee an email group uh, in NOAA for NOAA and NOAA partners with NEARS or Sea Grant programs. So if you're interested in that, on the last slide, you'll have some contact information. You can email us and we can get you on that list. Well, we're not that active, but we occasionally um, uh, make sure that we share what information we have at NOAA. And we also prevent information in forums like this. Um, this is probably our broadest talk. We sometimes convene a smaller, uh, more focused conversations. Um, we do that informally every few months as well. And then NOAA Sea Grant has the, um, a website focused on that Sea Grant research that we mentioned. And NOAA Fisheries recently updated our Coastal Blue Carbon website to really hone in on um, the work that we do that conserves and restores these coastal blue carbon habitats, you know, what, what specific role that conservation has. And we want to make sure to end the presentation today noting that um, we know that this work connects to a lot of things that are going on at NOAA. And I think this topic over the last decade has, um, we've adapted and changed even the way we talk about it, making sure we now say coastal blue carbon and are clear that we're talking about just these coastal systems, salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. Um, and we've thought about this topic and we've coordinated across NOAA in some of these first bullets here on coastal resilience and climate adaptation research and carbon cycle and um, change cycling, even climate change and sea level rise, which some of our research has been on. And I think some of the lower bullets, you know, we're hearing about more and trying to talk across NOAA and understand how coastal blue carbon fits or, or doesn't in certain parts of NOAA. Um, what, what role do we play in the broad marine carbon dioxide removal of the ocean? Um, marine protected areas, how coastal blue carbon plays a role there, or with marine ecosystems and even in fisheries management. Um, so there's definitely a broad, a broad amount of work that NOAA does where we could we could be um, kind of broadening our conversation or at least talking about if coastal blue carbon has the role across this other the other work that NOAA does. Mm -hmm. So on that point, we can um, close out the presentation and we have a few kind of broad questions that um, you know we're we're definitely interested in hearing from you if you have any questions for us about what was presented and also just would like to learn about any other collaborative opportunities across NOAA or um, any other ideas for how NOAA should be talking about close to blue carbon. So we would like to open up for some questions. That's great, Janine. Thank you. And everybody come on back for this Q&A time. Uh, this was very informative, uh, and I appreciate that you're, uh, you joined us today. Audience, we have uh, about 17 minutes for to answer your questions, so if you haven't already started doing so, please type them in the questions chat box on the right in your control panel. Uh, I also want to encourage you to download the slide, uh, slideshow from today's presentation. That could be found under the handouts uh, menu on, also on the right side of the screen. And one more detail before I start asking the questions uh, or reading the questions, I want to remind you all that this has been recorded. So we encourage you to share the link with interested colleagues or friends after we get done today. You can find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel. So uh, we started getting questions early on, so I'm going to go uh, chronologically through the questions. The first one asks, where, do, where does amelioration temporary fit in with your definition? Is it part of the definition of sequestration. I can also repeat that if you need Yeah, it. yeah I can add to the beginning of that because you can repeat it. Sure. Where does amelioration, temporary, fit in with your de definition? Is it part of the definition of sequestration? So I not sure what exactly is meant by amelioration. Um, that sounds like a temporary short-term process, perhaps. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess I'm not really sure what is meant by that. Um, we're not talking about that annual photosynthesis, that annual production of material. We're really talking about um, that long-term storage of material as sequestration. 
Um, I don't know that I've answered that question properly, though, so please feel free to um, clarify it and, and try to do it. Maybe someone else um, here would like to take a stab at that. No problem. Uh, we, are, we will, uh, I'll send that to you and maybe you can deal with this offline. Uh, the next question asks, how are low salinity marshes defined in terms of PPT salinity? How are they defined in terms of what? Uh, the person wrote PPT, an acronym. Oh, okay, sure. Yes, um, somewhere between 15 and 18 salinity uh, is about where we start seeing um, methanogenesis uh, being the dominant microbial decomposition pathway. So um, blue carbon habitats, um, we usually define, um, th this is actually an area where we need a lot more research, but I think about 18 parts per thousand is, uh, is uh, the, the boundary that is most commonly used. Thank you. This next question asks, does the blue carbon habitat mapping project include Alaska? Janine, I thought you were getting ready to answer that. Um, no, correct? Yeah, or it does. Hawaii. Is that correct also, Janine? Is it neither Alaska or Hawaii, or just not Alaska? It's, def it's definitely not Alaska. I'm not 100% sure on Hawaii. Same with Okay. Um, so this, this next question is specifically for Carolyn. It says, Carolyn, should macroalgae that is exported to the deep sea, either passively or actively, be considered blue carbon? How well do we understand the fate of this biomass? There is sufficient oxygen and in invertebrate micro microbial activity to support complete remineralization. Should we be concerned about the potential of deep sea sequestration of macroalgae to contribute to ocean acidification instead. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Along with uh, you know, we don't want to lose coral reefs or uh, oysters either. You know, um, even though that sequesters carbon. So I think that's a really interesting question that there is a lot of research focus on right now. Is uh, it is labile carbon? It's not stored in sediments. It, it I don't know how long it takes for it to get completely out of. Um, you know the 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 carbon budget the, the you know exchange with with the atmosphere i think right now uh there's so much algae macroalgae production around around the world that it probably does contribute some of that probably does end up um, removed from exchange with the atmosphere what percentage of that there is and and, and how important that is i i think that's uh a topic that there's a lot of current research on. I just I'd just like to quickly add, sorry I haven't talked yet. I'm Zach Canizzo with the with Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Climate Program Office. With respect to it being labile even when it's deep, I think it's also important to consider that a lot of times in a lot of locations this this labile carbon is exported to waters that are very deep. You're talking more than a thousand meters. And when, if it gets down to that level, even if it's remineralized, that carbon is often out of the atmospheric system for centuries to millennia. So on terms of climatological cl timescales, even if that carbon has been remineralized and not buried, it's essentially removed from the system. So I think that's another important thing to consider when we talk about kelp. And as Carolyn said, there's a lot of active research on it. So even though people are more and more starting to include it as blue carbon, there's a lot we don't know, which is important to keep active on and up to date on. Thank you so much for adding um, more to that question. This next question asks, coastal blue carbon habitats are also often designated as EFH or sometimes as ESA critical habitat, et cetera. Can you speak to NOAA's ability now or in the future to include an account for blue carbon when consulting with other federal action agencies on mitigating adverse impacts to these habitats? Well, I might let Janine step in on this, but my understanding is EFH, which is essential fish habitat, is language from the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, 
and ESA is um, Endangered Species Act. So both of those terms, I believe, are linked with federal regulatory legislation to protect those habitats. And I'll let someone else chime in on. Yeah. So if there's if there was if there's room in the considerations or the consultations on essential, safe, essential fish habitat. Uh, to consider the multiple benefits of a site, it could be additional information or additional um, an additional reason to consider um, protection of a habitat. Um, and the essential, uh, sorry, the Endangered Species Act as well. Um, it's another it's another consideration of the benefit of keeping that habitat or a restoration of that habitat. So there's definitely could be consideration within those um, particular consultations. Great, thank you. Um, this next question asks, how are coastal wetland losses due to sea level rise being addressed in the coastal blue carbon community of practice? I think that we have some research that's trying to better understand what happens when you have sea level rise. You know, where does that carbon go? Does it move? Um, so some of that, some research has already been done on that. Um, out of, I think out of your lab, Carolyn. Um, so some applied research and maybe some of our sea grant research too may be looking at that. Um, but, I, but, that, but I'd say it's at that level of trying to better understand what happens and how you can account for carbon when you have those changes on your coast. Yeah, and the, the other contribution I think no one makes, there's, there's a tremendous amount of interest in that right now. And so just the kind of baseline maps on marsh extent, as well as elevation, uh, as well, of course, the NOAA work on sea level rise itself. Uh, so it's kind of the foundational data that, that feeds these models that are trying to understand that relationship. Sea level rise can increase carbon accumulation, as I mentioned, but it also, of course, you know, subjects these intertidal systems to uh, loss, erosion, and drowning. That's a good question. Yeah, I agree. All right, this next question asks, how much do you integrate with the acidification program? We certainly talk to them. I don't have a formal, I mean, we, we do share uh, discussions, but we don't have a formal uh, affiliation with them. But you're, you're right, I mean, that's, that's the other side of, of, of point, certainly. Um, another question asked, and by the way, there's quite a few questions, so I, I, I'm hoping to get through all of them. Um, I was surprised to hear that freshwater sediments are not large carbon sequestration sources. What about peat moss? I thought those bogs were one of the largest sea res reservoirs and they're freshwater. So there's a difference between storage, so they do store a lot of carbon. Um, Peat bogs are also really recalcitrant. I was really talking about freshwater marshes and tidal marshes rather than uh, peat bogs, which have uh, a greater exchange uh, with the atmosphere than really deep peat bogs. I, I, I don't know about methanogenesis in peat bogs. It doesn't seem like that's going on very much. But that's really the problem with the freshwater marshes is the, is the amount of, um, of methane that's released. There is carbon stored, but the net flux does not um, add up as significantly as it does where as it does in saline marshes. And you know, terrestrial forests, of, of course, have a huge amount of carbon. So what, I think Janine made the point, um, or maybe it was, it was Lisa, you made the point that although these coastal wetlands are really, really good on a per unit basis at sequestering carbon, in terms of your aerial extent, they're very, very small. So they're really good at what they do. It's just that they're confined to a narrow band around their coastline. Excellent. Uh, this, uh, this next person gives you a compliment as well as a question. Thank you for the great presentation. Can NOAA provide direct TA to states that are in the process of building natural and working lands inventory to help meet state greenhouse gas reduction targets. States can have difficulty including coastal blue carbon relative to other landscapes like forests, et cetera. Carolyn, I think 
you you have for technical assistance is what I assume is meant by TA. Maybe you can talk a little bit about North Carolina, but I think in some situations we have provided some assistance in those state inventories. Yeah, I, I have worked with um, Lydia Olander and Katie Warnell from the Duke um, University Ecosystem Services Program, who I believe under contract with the U.S. Climate Alliance, they've been working on um, helping the six states, I think were mentioned in the, in the uh, presentation, to come up with um, not only assessments of how much carbon is stored now, but to model what will happen with sea level rise in terms of marsh migration and erosion of that marsh edge. And as, as uh, was also pointed out, the NOAA CCAP program, as we mentioned earlier, is really crucial, just knowing where these where these marshes are. So we have, I, I don't know if it's anyone other than me right now. Um, you know, we're not a big group, uh, but we certainly, uh, we have been working with and do provide data to support at least the U.S. Climate Alliance efforts um, uh, on the, in, in natural working lands in terms of carbon storage. Okay. Next question. What kind of efforts have there been to engage coastal landowners in wetland conservation in areas where marshes are migrating upland onto their lands? I, I, Go ahead. Go ahead, Janine. Oh, I would say that that's um, that probably, you know, that's, so, that's broad. It would be a little bit case based. And I know there's some studies specifically looking at areas where there could be migration but um so i don't know if someone has a specific example of a place where you know of a project specifically addressing that but a lot of our community um based restoration in the um restoration center um you know it's based on where there's a need and where there's a, a restoration problem and addressing that problem and that could also be um needing to you know think about where a marsh is moving is there a specific example anyone has well, that, that, that is a, a big issue um, I know of interest in the U.S. Climate Alliance work is, is trying to figure out, um, you know, agricultural lands, are they going to be protected? Is the marshes going to be able to migrate onto them? But the other point I would make that is kind of um, uh, related to that is, you know, this idea that marshes aren't going to be uh, where they are now in 50 years. So all of our restoration work and all of our conservation work really has to kind of take this idea into account that with sea level rise, uh, the physical location of these marshes actually is moving and there's lots of implications for that. Okay, next question. NRCS, Coastal Zone Soil Survey, is working to map and better understand effects of SLR and SWI on blue carbon storage in North Carolina and many other areas. How can we partner with NOAA in sharing and comparing data? Well, we, we've reached out a little bit in the past and uh, let's just keep doing it. Um, we, you know, we don't have a central uh, inventory, uh, database as you know, uh, the soil survey does and as does and as CERC does. Uh, but we certainly would um, like to contribute, like to contribute it and be part of that effort. This, uh, however, uh, however we can. Excellent. I think we have time for about two more questions, although there's so many more. And I just want to say to the audience, I appreciate your engagement, and we are planning on sending the uh, rest of the questions that we don't get to to our speakers so that they can address them offline. Um, but the next question uh, is, what are some priority research gaps in the coastal blue carbon space? I think these questions that have been asked have touched on a lot of them. Um, uh, transport of carbon out of the coastal zone into the ocean is a big question. Um, fate of macroalgae reduction is a big question. What is going to happen as sea level rises and marshes are drowned and that sediment is released into the, um, back into the estuary? Does it, does it get reburied? Does it get immediately um, decomposed by bacteria? What is going to happen as was just brought up with, uh, as these marshes try to advance into forests for uh, transferring agricultural land? So I, and, and what, how is the carbon accumulation rate going to change with increasing CO2 possibly increasing productivity, 
increasing temperature, possibly increasing decomposition rate, and uh, increasing soil accumulation rate. So there's it's there's there's decades and decades of research for all of us to do. Um, but I, but I think those are some of the more important questions. Well, this will be our last question, which kind of relates, but I'll, I'll ask it nonetheless. Are there opportunities for people to get involved with this project, particularly from research and or policy? Like, I guess internal to NOAA, if you're a NOAA employee, you can definitely, you know, reach out and you can join us. You know, we are a pretty informal um, group that meets and tries to make sure we're engaging across the programs at NOAA. Um, so that's definitely, you know, it's a community of practice. It's not, um, it's not an exclusive group. So if you're looking to collaborate better and participate, you know, you're welcome in. And if you're with one of those partner groups of Sea Grant or the nearest programs, there's that listserv, which is a little bit of information, um, a little bit more just information sharing. Um, but that's just one opportunity that we can be, you know, make sure we're talking across all the parts of um, what NOAA could be doing on this topic. I don't know if anyone has any other ideas. Yeah, and I, I think uh, there was an aspect of that that asked about the policy component. I think from an external uh, point of view, I, on the slides I listed some of the bills that have been put forward and I also noted some of the uh, member sponsors of that bill. And so I think understanding who your district member is, um, and seeing if perhaps they are engaged or interested in coastal blue carbon could be something um, going on their site and seeing how engaged they are. Or um, if you're in an area that has wetlands or any kind of coastal equities, uh, engaging with your office or representatives. And so I think that that would be the best way is just to learn a little bit more how you're being represented in your district. Wonderful. I, I'm really sorry to um, end this on the hour because this has been fascinating and has gotten so much interest. But uh, any last comments uh, from, from any of you in the in the, car, the Coastal Blue Carbon team? No? All right. Well, thank you. I'd like to conclude by thanking the NOAA Coastal Blue Carbon team for their presentation and for sharing their work with us today. And also, uh, to tell you that NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community, and we hope you will all join us again. Uh, don't forget that this was recorded, and we encourage you to go to our YouTube site to share the recording with others who might be interested. So be well, all. Thank you so much. <laughs>